My thanks to the uh, ARM organization for allowing us to present today. What I'm going to do today is, for the benefit of colleagues who may not have heard about Team Unity who are based in Europe, just give you a brief overview of who we are, our background, where we came out of. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to speak about one of our programs that's in the clinic right now, uh, and happy to take questions later on uh, after the uh, formal presentations end. Just going to disclose my forward-looking statements. Even as a private company, we still uh, believe in showing this. Um, so brief background of our corporate overview. Company actually was created in 2015 as a spin out out of the University of Pennsylvania. Nothing remarkable about that. Um, what is remarkable is it was the first time that the University of Pennsylvania actually made a financial investment in a company, which is highly unusual for a uh, very conservative Ivy League uh, university, but we were the beneficiaries of that. And that came around at the same time that the success of uh, organizations like Spark and Chop uh, had come to fruition, and we've clearly seen uh, the value that that's created, not just for those organizations, but for patients as well. Tied into that was a unique licensing agreement around uh, certain platforms and technologies, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we went, then went on um, by 2018. I actually joined the company at the end of 2016. Uh, prior to that, I was ahead of uh, the cell and gene therapies business at Novartis and had the pleasure of working with Carl June and the team at Penn for some years before this. Uh, we embarked on a, an ambitious Series A raise, which we closed at the end of the first quarter of 18. We raised $135 million in an untraunched fashion, which we're very proud of. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about who our investors are. And we moved very quickly in stealth mode into becoming a clinical stage company. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that as we get to our pipeline. I think we um, believe that we have um, some amazing leadership at the company in terms of our scientific founders. Uh, and together with, I'm very proud of the management team I've pulled together as well, who have experiences both in the commercial setting and the R&D setting, uh, in the cell therapy space and immuno-oncology as a whole. We were quite uh, courageous, I think, in our early days where we thought about the benefits of having our own manufacturing facility. Uh, and as you've seen, this is a continual topic of debate, and I think there's no uh, debating really now that companies who choose to invest in manufacturing in some shape or form are going to reap the benefits of that, as well as continuing to partner with CMO colleagues. We decided on leasing out our own facility uh, in northern Philadelphia, 46,000 square foot facility GMP ready uh, that we intend to actually have fully online by 2020 for multi-center trials. And we have the ability to expand that to 200,000 square foot if needed. So that was a a big stretch on our part when we were still a seed stage company, but we thought that was important. And uh, we licensed uh, at the end of the day over a dozen targets, and uh, I'm pleased to tell you that we'll be licensing some more, and you'll see some deal flow news coming from the company in the next uh, couple of weeks, actually. So here are our founders, um, luminaries in their own right in the field. Uh, Carl June, Bruce Levine, and Jim Riley have been working together for 30 years nearly together. They um, Originally started off uh, when Carl was in the Navy um, in the US um, working on HIV and applications of HIV um, lentiviral work and how to actually cure HIV with CAR therapies. And that spawned the entire field of CAR-T thinking together with other luminaries in the field like Michelle Sadline and others. Um, and Carl came over to Penn uh, approximately 16 years ago and established the team there. And we have five founders from Penn, uh, Yang Bing Zhao and Anshu being the other founders of Penn. And we also have Bruce Blazar, who is an expert in T regulatory thinking and autoimmune diseases, who was one of our original founders from the University of Minnesota. Um, I'm supported by a fabulous team. Uh, Michael Cristiano used to work with me closely at Novartis and actually was responsible for the architect of the original Penn Novartis deal. So uh, he has a lot of knowledge on the Corp Dev side. Jason Krentz is our head of manufacturing and chief technology officer with experiences uh, in cell therapy companies and biologics. Chris Coffin it was actually Carl June's first po pediatric postdoc uh, and trained as a pediatric oncologist and entered the industry over a decade ago and has now uh, come to join us as the chief medical officer. Graham Bell was formerly CFO at Intellia, uh, originally a Merck veteran, uh, came and joined the team six months ago, and Moji James is our general counsel. Uh, and so we are working fast and furious on executing our plan, supported by great investors. So this was our syndicate that came together with Penn uh, and Lily Asia Ventures seeding the round. We brought in diverse investors in the form of Ping An. The Parker Institute is a very heavy contributor to, to our uh, treasury. 
Uh, Gilead are also investors in the company, no product rights, just equity investment. And we also have strategic partnerships and investors in the form of Be The Match Biotherapies and Kleiner Perkins and Westlake came in as our US venture capital group. Uh, and as I say, we closed that round in early 18. So what is the model? Um, as we go around going top uh, left to right, um, the world kind of exploded in terms of synthetic biology since 2012. And so we are aware with the challenges of that. And many companies have great ideas in terms of how to harness a T-cell, how to regulate a T-cell. But the real challenge is getting that into the clinic and moving fast into clinic and efficiently. Uh, once you uh, have assembled the packages to get into IND, actually learning real time for every patient to help inform not just how you pivot in your trial designs, but in early settings of uh, solid tumors and liquid, difficult to treat liquid tumors, which is what T immunity is all about, but actually optimizing your manufacturing. These we felt back when we formed the company were disparate components that companies were thinking about in isolation, but very few were pulling it together under one hood. Uh, and that was the original thesis for the company that we brought together. And on the left, you will see that what we have in the operating model is that our founders at Penn, together with um, a 240-person unit that they've established at Penn, in effect handle our early research, discovery, and early translation. Uh, we work closely with them on the direction of the scientific work. We jointly select targets. We jointly optimize those targets. Um, and we then industrialize that uh, with, with our skill sets and bring those forward into INDs and rapidly scale those into both manufacturing at Penn, but also our own facility in terms of optimization and development of the product and moving forward to IND readiness and filing those INDs. And we think very long and hard, even as a very young company, around strategic commercialization, particularly value access and pricing. Uh, this is an area we can't leave to others or pharma partners to figure out. As you've seen from the topics of conversation in the panels today, this is probably the biggest, biggest thing we've got to solve for. Even uh, Guido Rassi this morning was highlighting the importance of that, and uh, that's certainly a big area of focus for us. And in our world, it's not just about new IP, it's also about trade secrets and know-how and manufacturing, which are critically important, which is why we spend a lot of time in our manufacturing thinking and know-how for the company. So hopefully it gives you a flavor of, of the model that we think is quite unique. But we think that this is now probably going to be very much a norm of how companies think about translating products rapidly through uh, translational medicine centers of excellence like Penn and then commercializing and industrializing them. Um, so a little bit of the playbook that sparked it with Chop. We built on that with a, a little bit more of an elaborate and extensive arrangement, but hopefully it gives you a flavor of what we're doing. When we're thinking about um, the unthinkable, which is really trying to tackle the microenvironment for difficult to treat uh, cancers such as solid tumors and liquid tumors, there's probably about seven, eight things we really drilled down upon as a company with our scientific founders, but the three areas that we really spend a lot of time on is how do we optimize the target, how do we optimize signaling, and how do we overcome immunosuppression? So if you bear that sort of thesis in mind, I'm going to use this as an illustration on one of our programs that's in the clinic to tell you how we apply these principles, and hopefully it'll come together for you guys in terms of how we're thinking about the company moving forward. Here is our disclosed pipeline. We are extremely privileged that we have a rich pipeline. I'm only showing you programs that are actively in that sort of um, entry into clinical uh, domains in the next 18 months to two years. Uh, we have programs, as you can see, uh, in an extensive variety of cancers, notable by its absence. We are not a CD19 company. We're not a BCMA company. Uh, we're very fortunate that we don't have to validate our platforms and technologies via that pathway because we kind of did it already in a, in a former life with, with uh, the basis of the platforms that eventually became Kimraya. But we are validating now in, in difficult to treat settings. So um, host of cancers here, uh, in the interest of time, I'm really going to power on and talk about one, one approach uh, using the optimizing target and signaling overcoming immune suppression as it relates to prostate cancer. And we're specifically targeting uh, individuals who are suffering with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. So to give you a patient profile, these are gentlemen who have uh, been diagnosed have basically exhausted every aspect of treatment that is available. They are medically castrated uh, with uh, very potent androgen deprivation therapies such as uh, Zytandi and Extiga. Um, they have been uh, surgically castrated in certain settings as well. 
These are patients who have cycled through a, a lot of palliative therapies, chemotherapeutic-wise, and basically the only option left for them is if you've not tried a particular androgen blocker, that's probably the only thing left for you. Um, so these are patients who actually, when you assess them, have pretty dried up disease because um, there's not actually a mass tumor mass there in the pelvis that, you know, this has gone into bony mets. Uh, they obviously have high PSA levels, but it's very hard to look at tumor shrinkage in these patients when you think about it. So a challenging patient population, but one with a huge unmet need. So here's how we took the approach. Uh, thinking about the microenvironment, we spend a lot of time digging in and, and thinking about the tumor biology because we believe that uh, to overcome cancer with solid tumors and T-cell engineering, it's not just gonna be about the antigen, it has to be about the whole ecosystem of how you think around that tumor type and the biology. In prostate cancer, one thing that is well known now, uh, within adenocarcinomas of the prostate and other adenocarcinomas like the pancreas, is that tgf beta is a pretty potent stimulator of, uh, sorry, immunosuppressive agent and oncogenic promoter when it comes to T cells. So normally T cell, um, TGF beta is a protein complex that's required for normal physiology, but it's in the setting of T cells, it causes potent immunosuppression. And normally what happens is TGF beta combines with uh, TGF beta receptor one and two. These receptors basically form a helix and they uh, signal through a kinase domain uh, and via a SMAD signaling mechanism lead to immunosuppression, a positive signal, but leading to a, an immunosuppressive state. So Carl and Yang Bing, two of our founders, thought long and hard about this, and they said, well, what if we're able to think about manipulating TGF-beta in the microenvironment, but let TGF-beta do what it needs to do peripherally? Because two decades ago, you may be aware, people tried to develop TGF-beta systemic blockers, and they ended up killing people for safety reasons, and so that was a big no-no. So how do we circumvent this challenge and try and do this at the biology level of the cell? And what they came up with is a, the following. They actually uh, decoded the, the receptors one and two and figured out that receptor arm two is the most potent piece of the puzzle because that actually latches onto the kinase domain and, and leads to the cascading of the signal. And they actually truncated that receptor. They knocked out um, a portion of it. And then we were able to force express this as a dominant negative receptor in vitro and in vivo. And so the idea being that TGF beta traps, but the signaling mechanism itself uh, doesn't occur, uh, and you're able to actually prevent that signaling happening. This was then combined in one actual lentiviral vector package, both with a prostate cancer-specific car, so highly optimized in terms of P PSMA affinity tune. So uh, we're great believers in affinity tuning um, of, of the SCFE components, and trying to optimize as best as we can the co-stimulatory domains. And this was then packaged into one construct and delivered and with quite remarkable in vitro, in vivo responses in animal models. And we fast-tracked this and took this into the clinic. And so we're currently dosing in this phase one trial with this combinatorial approach uh, by um, constitutively um, targeting the mechanisms within the, the T cell itself by this TGF beta dominant mechanism and, a, and an affinity tune car. We have dosed uh, a number of patients now, three cohorts. We start off with a low dose cohort. On the left, you'll see that that's about 50 million cells in a non lymphodepleted cohort. We, cured, we cleared that safety hurdle. We then moved into the next cohort, which is uh, the half a million to a billion cell range. And now we're actively dosing patients with lymphodepletion now um, and seeing some very interesting uh, responses early on. I'm, I'm not in a privileged position to share that data today. I'm very excited about that data, but I don't want to jeopardize further publication and presentation, so watch out for this space in future solid tumor conferences that we intend to present this data. Uh, and we're already moving on to the next generation of product uh, within this uh, host of prostate cancer thinking. So our next offering will likely be uh, another approach to manipulate the microenvironment where we're thinking about a PD-1 CD-28 switch, whereby instead of, um, for example, knocking out PD-1, which we're able to do in another program, we're actually looking at a mechanism whereby a PD-1 ligand attracts to a switch mechanism whereby CD-28 uh, turns into a potent vehicle to then co-stimulate the cell further, another way to overcome immunosuppression. So we're hoping to actually take that as an IND candidate next year 
uh, as more of a life cycle iteration. We consider this Gen 2, but we've got to think about Gen 3 and 4 pretty quickly in this space. So in terms of realizing the plan, I've already mentioned uh, our efforts on manufacturing. Um, our real focus here is on process science and development, viral vector um, methodology in-house where we're looking at upstream, downstream research grade vector that we're bringing in, but also then planning clinical supply grade for uh, clinical trials, multi-center registration, but also deciding how much are we gonna rely on partners from a CDMO perspective for vector versus internal build as well. Because the reality is as much as companies like ours are focused incessantly on non-viral vectors, and that's a big area of research and development with potential partner companies in terms of how do we circumvent um, right now, in our hands, lentiviral vector works very well in terms of transduction efficiencies and actually creating product. But we know that that is a world that's fast changing. So we are looking ahead as to where the puck will be moving. And we're spending a lot of time on non-viral vector methodologies, both in terms of uh, gene editing approaches, but also how do we introduce new components into cells in more disruptive ways. So watch this space as we produce more partnerships and talk about that in the future more with you. Um, so, in a whistle-stop tour in the time we had, and I was conscious we were running short of time, um, it's a real privilege to lead a company that is now uh, well-financed for initial stages. We're currently fundraising and thinking about future financial optionality. Our bold ambition is to put two INDs into the clinic every year, multiple shots on goal, because that's how we think cancer is going to be cured. We are agnostic to whether something is a TCR platform or a CAR-T platform. We have capabilities in both. And we're really excited about the potential for treating huge unmet needs and a lot of patients that are desperately waiting for these therapies. And it's been a real privilege to hear many companies also share that same passion and uh, want to forge ahead with really translating what is what was considered to be synthetic biology to now real products uh, and get into patients around the world as soon as possible. So thanks for your time. <laughs>